so I'll start with some introductions of the wonderful people we have here today, and then we'll get right into it. So I'll start with Asma. Asma Jama is a Danish-born Somali artist, a poet, and a founder of Dakan Collective, which is a feminist art collective. Uh, they've been published in Printer Online, places that you're probably familiar with, The Good Journal, Ambit, and um, Asma's work has been translated into French, Swahili, so Somali, Spanish, and Portuguese. Uh, uh, quite a feat, and most recently they were shortlisted for the Brunel Africa Poetry Prize and longlisted for the National Poetry Competition. Asma is an inaugural alumni of Obsidian Foundation and is a Cave Cannon Star Shine, Shine and Clay Fellow. Um, and then we also have Nick Mokahar here with us today, who's the founder of the Obsidian Foundation, um, winner of the 2021 Avengers Prize. Um, in 2017, Nick's debut collection, collection, which I personally really enjoyed, Kingdom of Gravity, was shortlisted for the uh, Felix Dennis Prize for Best First Collection and one of the Guardian's Best Books of the Year. Um, kind of all the accolades here in the, in the room with us. Um, Nick is also a Cape Cannon Graduate Fellow and a Complete Works an alumnus. He's won several prizes, including Brunel's, the one um, that Asma was shortlisted for, um, and has been published in a number of places, New York Times, Tri-Quarterly, and a number of other places. Um, Nick is a trustee for the Arban Foundation and Ministry of Stories and a member of Malika's Poetry Kitchen Collective. So kind of an exciting uh, set of people who have to get in the room. My name is Alexis Day or Alex. Um, I am a co-founder of Encara Review and a new imprint based in Nairobi called Magic Door uh, Imprint. So wonderful set of folks here today. And I really want us to get us started with really what's brought us here together and that is poetry. So Asma, if you would be willing, I'd love to hear you read and get us kind of started to, to dig in together. Take your time. Okay, cool, thank you. Um, I'll start by reading a poem about my father. Um, okay. I ask how he crossed the water and made it out whole. In the light, my father hides the star of his fin from me, the way it shines guilt, and says in a whisper, on our knees, God decided who exited, who was exiting. Later, I transcribe the interview and say, I'm making an archive where there was none. When really I'm taking his skin and his annotated traumas and exhuming his skin and his annotated traumas to be exhibit A, exhibit B. This is how I find myself making a world from his mouth, holding open an album, unpeeling his photographs from the page, glue fraying. This one of him standing outside the bus, that one of him like the land, endless and broken. This one of my father, bone empty of marrow, that one of him, molten, sitting on a bed, looking like liquid. I go again to interview him and I want to say, put down the names you have been carrying in your loose skin, like you were their only memorial. And instead I say, remember, remember again, the sound your bone made when it broke and how long you lay in the quiet of the crash till they found you. I tell him I am archiving, when really I am a net and he is a loose body, I sacrifice on the altar of collective memory, forgetting there is a blessing in forgetting, forgetting why a wound heals, because a scar is an empty space and a new beginning. And I was gonna read another poem. Okay, cool. Uh, this one is called um, For Ahmed and it's after Lena Khalaf Tufaha. Ahmed Alhamd, now one for whom others are grateful. Ahmed alone, watching a fish move till he became a net, swallowing an anchor hole, threw off his body and was a blueprint home, a sight, a flotation device, a wound, iodine, the needle his brother used, the flame after, petrol shine on a black body, a mouthful of something which was everything. Ahmed say lodestar, say ocean in his first language, can't remember homonyms, carried the road here anyway in his crevices, swallowed it drinkable, gave in hollow, caved, asked to be a shadow and was a hole, the bucket after, wanted, spent. Ahmed asleep the first time he missed his wife, turning mortal without land, say someone else's earth now. Ahmed thankful, prayer made out of thigh bones and sweat, folded to a god that couldn't hear him, Ahmed or his children, all their names, oil in too distant water the last time they spoke, date pits to stand. Ahmed in wudu, water held in air, made the Atlantic mouthfuls with his palms. 
Thank you. Thank you for that. I like the word lodestar. Um, that's kind of echoing still around in my in my mind. Um, okay, let's start. Um, and the meditation that we have with us here today is around poetry and literature um, as battlefronts, thinking of ourselves as soldiers. And, you know, I personally resist that militaristic language. And But I, I do want to think about standards, the old word of standards, like that. To going to war and whose flag are we bearing? Which identities are we faithful to? Um, for whom are we fighting? If, if anyone, if at all. So I'd love to, to open, you know, to you, Nick, kind of sort of think with us: who, who, and to whom are you faithful? And um, if you are a soldier, in in, in whose in whose uh, for whose sake are you fighting? Um, I'd say I fight for language. I think. Um... I don't know how Asma feels about this, but uh, language is what has allowed me to exist in different spaces uh, or understand myself in, in relation to different spaces because you're always in a sense of whether you belong or don't. Uh, you're identified by many different things that make you either them or the other. So if you don't speak the right language, you're the other. If you don't look the right way, you're the other. If you don't think the way somebody else thinks you're the other. So language is the only thing that seems to cut through um, some kind of understanding. So you, I guess for me, I fight for language because it is, even though it's the same thing that you, you can be misunderstood in language, it's also the same thing that, that connects you. So a lot of times people have, you know, I've, just listening to Asma's poems there, I, there was a connection. There were things I could relate to or things I had not seen and now I see. So, um, I fight for that because uh, I think oftentimes we use language quite loosely or aggressively and um, um, people often don't realize the intimacy of language because who, who would we be without it? Who would we be without it? I know it's wonderful when you say that. I was thinking of exactly that. As you say, it is both the reason that we are criminalized, it's our shield, we can weaponize it against others, it's such a kind of terrifying, manip easily manipulated, and, and then again, like you say, wonderful, wonderful thing it is, language. Um, Asma, tell us, what are you fighting with and for? I think, um, for me, I identified with what Nick said when he mentioned the other, and I think as someone who feels like they're on the margins, I've always felt like I'm I'm constantly asking myself when I'm in a space who's the most marginalized and how can I align myself with them? Not necessarily to to fight for them, but also just to listen, I think. Um, so it might be the elders, it might be people that are, I don't know, economically disenfranchised, it might be the people that, the people that are overlooked. And I feel like in every context, even in my context as a as Somali, um, there's always these power dynamics that are at play. So I think I have to be, I think I try to be responsible and think about what power I hold in this space. Um, yeah. And to align myself with people who have less less power in that space than me. Yeah, and so tell us a little bit more about who you're in solidarity with. I think the idea of working in concert, sort of this unified where the individual is both significant but subsumed and subsumed under this group so i would wonder like what groups are you in fellowship with who are you in coalition with is that a question to me yeah. yes please yeah um so i think for example with the work that i do with Dagan collective that's with two somali women fazia isma and ayan elmi and i think the way that we work for me feels like working like in in fellowship so we work with elders, we work with young people um, who are Somali who like in, and, and black as well, who in Bristol are very like, well, the place that I'm based are very um, overlooked by the, uh, let's just say by the council, by, by society as a whole. Um, and we work to like create with them. So we try to make this structure that's like flat, so we're all equally paid and we're all equally considered artists. Um, and I think even back in Somalia, often in poetry you see a similar thing happening where men are are kind of elevated in position and women's poetry is often has often been like forgotten or erased um, because nobody bothers to 
remember it, nobody bothers to recite it, or it's kind of seen as shameful too. So I think for us, it's kind of, yeah, thinking about how, how we can center women, non-binary people, black people, our communities essentially, um, and co-create with them, I think. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I love that idea of sort of finding room and making room for each other. Um, and I found, and I'm kind of, I, I absolutely love the idea of also being in a time with people who think with you and see with you. And, and I think uh, um, the times that I, was, I found it hardest to write were when I didn't have similar, some of that community, but I often went back to, um, and that's why maybe a lot of us go back to books. I found that community, people who were who were dead, who in some cases might hate me if they were to meet me, if I were in their time, but still I found so much solace in their work and, and, and I curved out some delight for myself in that. So I would love to hear from you, Nick, and then Smile on which thinkers as, do you often return to, um, and particularly if there are any folks who are really radical writers, again, going back to the more on dissidents, who comes to mind, who do you often return to? Maybe Nick, you want to go first? Uh, yeah, I mean, the word fellowship, um, I, I often come to the language ignorant, if I'm honest. So even though you know more, you the more you know, the more ignorant you realize you are. So fellowship is often a, a state of listening. So like you said, you I listen to love. Dead poets I also listen to contemporary poets. But I'm just listening. It's kind of like sitting on a mountain and you're listening to all the sounds. So um, I realize um, I belong to many groups that are, um, they work independently of themselves, but collectively they run through me. So, you know, Obsidian is a, is a community. Um, as much as possible, it is a flat structure. Um, as much as I'm the founder, they are the main people who are imposing ideas on it are, are women and that's, and black women at that. Um, and I think that that's for many reasons. I think um, I've seen, or the TV has shown me instances where either the black body or the black woman are at the bottom of a, of a power dynamic. So uh, when I saw Obsidian, one of the things I, I didn't want was to perpetuate that. So I'm in fellowship with, with the, that conversation. It means having hard conversations. I'm in fellowship with other writers uh, on different levels. Um, and we're always talking about, you know, well, not just writing, because people just assume that all we're talking about is writing, but actually the state of the world because the world imposes itself on my family, on my, on my wife, on my children. And, and right now, that, I mean, it always concerns me, but right now it really concerns me because people are making decisions in a world where um, that have direct impact on their daily existence. So I guess I'm in fellowship with, with minds that can help me navigate through this world and protect my family. I don't know why I said that, but that's what's on my mind. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for that. I think I was, um, I was starting to think through fellowship um, as you were pulling apart that thread um, and discomfort. And of course, we've been talking about making space for safety and us to face truths that are hard and difficult. And I think um, if you are a writer, a poet, even a person who just inspires discomfort and fear purely by being in your body. I think that it takes a toll over time. But I wanted to think through two things with you. One, sort of what is one awkward truth and you sort of getting at that now that you have to continually take apart and parse within the way you move through the world. But then secondly, how do you, how do you maintain stamina, delight, joy? Um, how do you stay open when you are being read and perceived often either if not as a threat, as trivial, as meaningless. And I wonder if you would think with me on that. Asma, you want to see you nodding? Go ahead. No, I just think it's a really interesting binary, like being considered either a threat or, or being considered meaningless. Um, yeah, I was thinking of a, of a few of the poets that I think of, um, well, perhaps to start, like I think the awkward truth for me is that I think I'm I'm quite like a coward in the sense that when I when I think about the poets that um, 
are, are, are kind of like inciting this like revolutionary push and movement forwards that we desperately need, it does require it does it does require that you stake something, you know, and that, and it isn't easy. And I think I think there's um, yeah, I feel like I feel some kind of I feel like I'm in this weird in between space because when I think about um, Somali poetry traditionally, that it was really seen as like um, the poet's role is to critique the nation. And so there's this poet that when I was younger called Hadrawi that my dad told me about who um, was imprisoned because of because of his work. Um, and I think, of course, we have like there's there's this tradition across the continent, even with Wale Sinka, of poets, I guess, or writers being ending up imprisoned because of their work. Um, yeah. And I think, of course, I think language is really important. And I think the words that we choose are incredibly important and powerful and can inspire movement. And I think for me, it's it's like, I think the awkward truth is that I don't, I don't know if I'm like courageous enough, you know, to actually say something when it matters. Um, yeah, yeah, if that makes sense, I'm not sure. But I also wanted to mention uh, Amiri Baraka and um, Jill Scott Heron. Those are also two names that I thought of when you were both speaking. I saw I saw uh, Jill Scott Heron at the Jazz Cafe, and I actually had a conversation with Amiri Baraka in um, in Norway. He actually came. Oh, no was, way! Wow. Yeah, yeah. So I was I was in um I was doing my one man show on a boat in Norway. There's a theatre. There's a boat. I can't remember what it's called. And um, I finished the show, and I went backstage, and I was you know getting changed. It was for the British Council. I was getting changed. And Amira Baraka walked in and he goes, yo, that was amazing. And um, I mean, that, that's just how I met him. So I, I'm just giving you context. But the, uh, I remember a few days later, um, there were many things we could be doing that night, but he was around and I just sat and just listened to him talk about, you know, what we're talking about activism. And I don't, I, initially he didn't want to be an activist. He just wanted to be a writer, but he could see what was happening to his people. And he just couldn't stand it, and he, you know, he had to do something about it. I don't, and I think I don't think bravery is the right analogy, that you know, or the right term. I think what it is, it's it's almost out of desperation, you know. And and there are different forms of activism. I think now, because we live in a digital age, when I say this politely, there's this kind of pseudo activism where you can you have the most hits, you have the most vo volume. But there's also an activism as simple as telling the stories that we don't hear. So when you know asthma are telling stories that, you know, a lot of the, the invisibility of our of of whatever it is, our culture, our men, our women, our children, when you reveal that story, I feel go, I've never heard this story before. That's a form of activism. And it's just as loud as somebody shouting, This is wrong. Because you can you can shout this is wrong, but sometimes why don't we show them what's right? What's right is, did you know about this? This exists. So I think, I think now we live in this kind of pulpit, you know, soapbox, Instagram, you know, visual era. Um, you know, I always think of Vincent Kwesi Johnson. His activism, he, he wasn't trying to be an activist. He was, con these were people he was con genuinely concerned about and he, he spoke about it. So the, the, you, the language is the last thing. You come to language because you, there is nothing left else to say. I have to say this. So I don't think a lot of times people are speaking before the action. You know, sometimes you need the action, you know, and in desperation, you've got to say something, you know, the utterance, you know. So um, I don't know if I'm making sense, but uh, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I think when you were talking about this fear of will you be able to take the stand, as not thinking through, Nick, when you talk about the different forms activism can take, but also being thoughtful that we also pushing that as far as we can go and being truly faithful to the communities we care about. I think um, my concern has often, especially the last two years, seeing um, what it has meant to be working and trying to stay alive in this community. Uh, and by that I mean broadly, very closely to my family and then widely to all the artists and, and writers that I, I spend so much time with. Um, the cost and the toll that trying to st stay 
in late stage capitalism, thoughtful and open and caring and um, active, I think that cost is so high. Um, and to me, I think organizing is central to that. Absolutely. And I think that language becomes such an important tool. And I, I think I'm personally trying to ask myself, can I take that a bit further? Like you say, these conversations that I'm having, can I um, be more invested in other ways of, of service and other ways of action? Um, and I'm also trying to remind myself not to perpetuate the same violence that's performed against us, which is to say, writing doesn't matter. It doesn't change anything. I don't want to perpetuate that because I knew for a fact it does. It, that's why I'm still alive. However, I, I want to stop this unnecessary binary in my head of like, you can write or you can act. Writing is action, thinking is action. Um, so how do I add different types of action to that little package there? Um, and so then I started to think through, particularly um, when solidarity now, what what spaces am I willing to occupy? Like given, if I, if I start from the premise that I must take different types of action, I must support other types of action, which groups am I, do I feel like I should be leading the actions and which, which group should I step back? So I wanted to think through to you, if you have any limits, like what work will you not allow your writing to do? What rooms do you think you shouldn't be in? Um, where is the space for poetry and where should poetry step back if there's such a space like that? Um, so I'll think what are the boundaries of our resistance through poetry? Um, I don't know if that's spurring anything, if anything that is resonating, but go ahead. Um, I, mean, I try not to get into that conversation when I'm writing because it, it, it contaminates the actual art of creation. So the politics of what my writing will do, I, I don't know at, at, the, at the time of creation. I, all, all I know is I have to write about things that matter. So whatever, I, and I, I don't mean that in a kind of hairy fairy way. In other words, things I'm writing about mean something to me or to the people I'm writing about or trying to bring into existence. Um, so that's the first space, and it's a creative space. I, I think, you know, whatever I create is, is, is a piece of art, and I, I don't mean that in a, in a presumptuous way. I just, I mean, the first thing I'm trying to create is a piece of art. It, by its very nature, by the fact that it's been made by a black body, by a black man, you know, it will create a politics. The fact that it's in the 21st century will create another politics. The fact that I'm living in in Europe will create another policy. The fact that I'm African will create another policy. The fact that I'm Ugandan and so on and so forth and so forth. Those politics will be applied to it after I've created the art. But while I'm creating the art, the most important thing at that time is to be true to how can I make this the best of whatever it is it is. And then, you know, people will then infuse all those political angles to it. Um, when you say about what spaces I won't allow it in, I, I don't want my work to be used in any way to harm a my people, and and that, that's broad. But may, uh, the most obvious is black, you know, you know, women like that. If I see it being used in any of that, those ways, I'm, no, I'm not, I'm not interested. Um, um, it can be fun, it can be playful. I don't mind that. It can be you, you can send it up. I don't mind that. But you know, I've seen enough. I see enough violence, um, both physical and verbal, to black people, I'm, I, I'm, I, I can't entertain it anymore. And I will call it out. So those, I guess that, that's there, but that's outside of the process of cre creation. So, um, I, mean, I mean, as we know, so for example, it's important to have safe spaces, you know, whether that, sometimes that's just silence. Sometimes just just knowing you can say what you need to say without being accused of of some ulterior motive. You know, I and and just and sometimes you just want to say what you say, and you and we don't have to agree. Like safe space doesn't mean we agree, but it means that you can say what you need to say. Because sometimes when you you're closing off what somebody's trying to say, that's not safe. You're not allowing them to to say what they're thinking because our thoughts aren't always accurate. But we at least need to untangle them, you know. I know. Sorry for talking so long. As well, you might have some insight on that as well. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Could you repeat a part of the question again? Yeah. What What work won't you allow your poetry to do? What rooms do you think poetry has no space in? If there's something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I think I I definitely agree with Nick. Um, 
at what Nick said, of course, but also that, um, yeah, that I won't allow my work to do harm. Um, but I was also thinking of maybe I'm not sure so much in the in the British context, but um, anecdotally, I was told of let's just say a particular East African country where there's like um, a poetry um, collective that was using its events to support um, a government at the time, while well, government that's still like you know at the moment is like perpetuating violence against a group of people. And I think for me, I think, again, I think poetry is incredibly powerful. I think it, sh it should be in every room, but I think that's personally where I and the, you know, the people that I was speaking to would draw some kind of line um, to not like, to not support people that are also doing harm um, and to not create work that can be used as like propaganda. But of course, at that point, I don't think you're, it depends whether you're in control or not. But if you are in control and you're intentionally facilitating a space and facilitating a platform that ends up being violent to other people, then I don't I don't think I would be able to do that. Well, I wouldn't do that. And I also think um, I probably, for you, I, I try to consider my positionality. Um, so I don't think it's like, I think it's maybe an acting harm in like a different way. Um, because I'm in the diaspora and I've never actually been to Somalia. So I try to always consider, even when I'm writing, whether I am the person to be writing about this particular story. And I think that's something that I try to to think about is to, yeah, to think about my, like the power in that dynamic as well, you know, like I might I might be able to talk about migration or I might be able to talk about war, but I try to talk about it from, the way that I'm connected to it, which is like through my parents or through my family, as opposed to someone who's experienced it themselves, which is not true. So I think I, I try to, I try to do that. And I try to read the work of artists and engage with the work of artists who think really like intentionally about the work that they do so that you're not, so you don't end up creating work that's like painful or damaging um, for the people that it's speaking about and for the people it's meant to be speaking to. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, thank you. Yes. Yeah, I'm still thinking with a, a bit of the different threads that you both sort of unspooled in my mind. Um, but I would love to hear more about your writing practice. Um, I know, I know, you know, it's been observed by several people. Uh, people of color rarely get asked to talk about craft. So I love to hear how you approach writing, how you practice honing that work and, and, and changing your style if that's been changing over the years. So tell me about your journey as a poet and how that's been changing and how you keep keep growing um, in that regard. Maybe you want to start, Nick? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, as, as we know, you were, you were at the Obsidian Retreat process is something I'm very, I'm very into. I think we're in it all the time. So for example, like I'm, I am always being a man in the same way. I'm always being a writer in the same way. I'm always being a, you know, husband or a, a father, you know, or a son. But you know what you what you're not always aware is how effective you're or ineffective you're being in it. So um, I'm always testing what I call the process. So um, it used to get me down at the beginning because I didn't think I had I had a process and which which was inaccurate. I did have a process, it just wasn't effective um, as far as writing. Um, so my initial um, process was I only wrote when I was inspired. And my definition of inspiration was this feeling. And if I didn't have that feeling, then I wouldn't write. And that wasn't useful, especially if you're trying to make a career out of this. So it's, it's kind of like, imagine that football saying, I can only play when I feel like it. So what, well, you can't play every Saturday? Mm, I don't know. Yeah, so I had to change that concept of this inspirational feeling, and I had to bring in processes. So, so sometimes you're 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 writing or you're not writing, but you still got to do other things. You know. So what what is the training that you're doing? What is the reading? And I had to admit that my reading was at best weak. You know, or or you know, amateurish, if that makes sense. So 
reading, you know, your favorite comics isn't necessarily reading for poetry, you know, or or reading, you know, uh, your favorite hip hop magazines isn't necessarily reading for poetry. Not that they're bad, you know, it's just, so I had to improve my reading um, for anything. And then, uh, then there's this thing called craft because um, poetry is actually, a, a, it's kind of like a martial art. You know, you, 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 you've actually, to get better at it, you've actually got to do a lot of things that you don't like doing. You know, so like, you know, you know, in karate, you're like, you're doing this move, my hand hurts. So, you know, if I say to you, so what are rhymes? How do rhymes work? Or if I say to you, what is the line break? You know, you know, sometimes we can write instinctually and I get that, but you actually have to learn these things. And I, so there's this reading time and then this breaking down of this entity called poetry, which is actually a musical device, which people forget. So it's, you, you're actually in many ways learning an instrument, which is, which is these words, and then the way these words come out of your body and the way they, they land on a page, all of that is the process. Um, and so for my process to answer your question, um, I try and read as much as I can all the time. Um, I, I read sporadically. So I, sometimes I read something cover to cover. Sometimes I'm reading a poem a day just from a, from a website. Sometimes I'm reading, you know, um, you know, I, I think I was reading as I threw me her manuscript, it was like some dope poems. Like I heard that poem, I've heard that poem. She's been working on it, that poem is dope. The, the first version was great. So I'm reading other people's work. Uh, as you can see my library, I'm, I'm trying to go through it and, and, and try not to pretend that I have a library, but I actually read the library, which is a, a lot harder than you think. So I fail every day trying to read my library. Um, so there's that, and then there's the actual writing of poems which oh my gosh i find it hard. Like there's you can write poems and a lot of them are bad but to write good poetry ooh, it's like climbing a mountain so you have to start writing you start at the bottom where you can write these easy ones and then as it gets higher it gets harder you have to work more i find when i'm really writing poetry i get very exhausted good poetry i become very exhausted so then i have to work on my health which is i don't know if that sounds strange but that's just me as my, let me talk, I'll talk too much there, but you, you go. No, it makes a lot of sense. Everything you said. Yeah, um, I agree with you. I think also like your, I learned, I learned a lot in terms of, um, I think Nick's process from Obsidian. That was really interesting. Um, I think for me, I think a lot in terms of images. Um, so I always find myself gravitating towards, of course I read, but also like, yeah, towards like visuals, it be it like photographs or films um, or performances. And I think I just like, I'm subconsciously gathering or sometimes consciously gathering um, a bunch of images that align. Like for example, I was really obsessed with like water and now it's kind of shifted to petrol, gasoline, things that are burning. And um, because I paint or I, like I work with people and make like, um, I guess moving image projects or sound. I think I'm like try. I try to explore the same, like a, a theme that I'm chasing, but with like different mediums. And if I find that I can't like write about it, then I'll try to paint about it, or I'll try to do something sound wise. And then I'll I'll find that I can write about it later. But it will mostly be just like this re recurring like, and maybe like a specific word or something that comes back. Um, and I think then I find that like a lot of the work that I make has, I don't know, this set of images that's like consistent in them. And I, I try to like change it or change it up after. Um, also, I found that whenever I like work with people, I think that's really great for my poetry writing, like it not being like a solitary activity, but being like in conversation or in collaboration with other people. Um, I think the person I'm most in conversation slash collaboration with is actually my father because he um he's always like very open to talk and I, I always find whenever I, I speak to him my my thinking around something shifts where I try to consider it from a different perspective. So yeah, I think we kind of have that that process. Um and I think finally I try to read like um poetry that's also like um, not in English or wasn't originally written in English like in translation because I think um, sometimes there's like yeah I think like in the English 
canon you have like this whole like set of images and I think whenever I read um work that comes from like a different context um there are, there are all these like beautiful metaphors and things I I never would have considered thinking about like I really like the work of Aga Shahid Ali for example or there's this really great wonderful young um writer called Ibrahim Hirsi who um is Somali and he's based in the UK and he also translates a lot of poetry from Somali into English and so when I read his work I'm like it's just ph phenomenal because it's like there's like in for example Somali poetry there's there's this obsession with like the camel we have like I think more than a hundred words for different types of camels um so then you can imagine like the that that world and that imagery is like so so rich and so I think I'm just like constantly just yeah trying to find new images to play around with yeah yeah, that's absolutely magical. Um, oh, yeah. I, yes, I, yes. Sorry, I just cause still hung up on the work in translation. Um, I think when I first thought, oh, I should write seriously, uh, kind of like you, Nick, I was very sporadic. It's like, uh, we'll go with the flow, kind of. <laughs> um, so then I, at the time I was working as a translator, so at the time I was translating the Communist Manifesto, actually the most painful exercise I have done in a long time. But then I noticed, like when I came out of that process, like six months of really painful <laughs> work, um, the, the thinking and the poems is so much different because I think I had performed kind of a weird exorcism where I wrote, when I wrote in Israeli, I wrote in Israeli. When I wrote in English, I wrote in English. And almost like I, I had this idea, the stories I had in my head of what English poetry looks like, they didn't incorporate Israeli. And I think just that exercise kind of broke that open for me, that dam started to flow better. And absolutely, I think it's been, Sort of one of those delicious processes since then. Um, I want to go back to the health one, which I loved as a call out for part of the process, Nick. Like, how do you stay excited? How do you stay delighted? How do you keep the joy? Because the work can get hard, um, uh, staying open to a lot of these facts that are often quite painful um, and difficult to assimilate. How, what keeps you delighted? What keeps you in concert and willing to put in the work in, 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 in fellowship or alone, which I know a lot of writing is in solitude. Tell me more about what's what's keeping you there. Uh, um, I don't know. I, I have to, th on, on one level, I have to thank God. Um, and I say, I don't say that lightly. I'm not trying to be holy in that. It, it, there are many days I want to give up. And I think a lot of people don't see that if I'm being honest. Um, I think, I think you have to get what it means to you to to keep going um and, it, and all the things that you stick at it's because you realize what they mean to you it's uh and i'm and I'm, i don't mean that in a horrible way because it's as a black body it's easy to give up because you're also dealing with aggression you're dealing with microaggressions you're dealing with racism constantly you know if you're a woman you're dealing with sexism or, or you know whatever other kind of person that you are they're dealing with these things so then how do you then on top of that create a space to write which is a delicate space right it's a delicate space because it's not your ego writing that's what people think it is they think it's your ego or something i think a lot of but you can write with that but usually that's that's quite bad writing so i can tell that you know the poem we just heard from as wasn't from her ego because there's nothing to make them look good there it was it was it was about saying something that we had not seen before and that that listening, that thinking, uh, to 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 keep your keep your antenna open for that, you know, when you're going through your life, which can consist of ups and downs, and in out out of set for most people right now for the last two years, whether they want to admit it or not, their life has been a down, you know. So to keep your 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 focus, you know, or your your lightness of touch, because that's what it is. Writing is a lightness. Or, or, or more accurately, it is a light, yeah? Um, to keep that light on requires a lot of letting go of whatever the existing situation might be presented. So you might feel down and you might not want to write and you might actually prefer to sleep. I, I, I have felt in all those spaces. But sometimes I just need to be at my desk because, you know, I'm in a position where I can write. There are people who want to tell the stories that I get to tell, but they can't write. And I think that puts me at my desk. Um, 
also it's a gift like you really forget that like it's a gift you know so there's certain things that we, if we get if i if i gave you a new car you would understand that it was a gift but people don't get like if you were to lose language if all this conversation wouldn't even exist without language so that same tool and and you can and this other thing i want to add is that a lot of times we use language at its lowest form so low um kind of has to be so i'm hungry um you've been horrible to me that, that that's it's at its lowest form but language can do a lot more so and i say this you know if you if you look at the you open a bible you open the quran it tells you how important language is in the beginning was the word like that that is a cool that is saying in the beginning so when everything was being considered before everything could be understood language and so to have the ability to have language and to get that it, it is it is worth more than many other things yeah that it brings everything into being and so you know a prophet says something and the rains come down <laughs> you know, that's language they don't think it they go like if you see watch films and you watch thanos he's doing this and all that no the prophet goes rain bang this that you know so what, what you have to understand is language is, is a lot more important than we give it credence and we a lot of times we lose it we're using it at its lowest level so as a poet I sit with language thinking, wow, I get to use language. To other people, they just think, wow, well, he's, he's just playing with words. And they're, and they're not understanding. I've been given one of the rarest gifts on the planet. I don't know if that makes sense. No, it makes so much sense. And I, I think, like, I think it's what you're saying is that being able to make a world, um, being able to exist somewhere else. <laughs> I think when I was younger, also kind of escape, escape, escape the world or escape whatever reality I was in. Um, and now that you've mentioned the Quran, I remember um, being told that, or I remember always being obsessed with this image that essentially like when the world ends, that all of the Quran will be wiped and it'll just be empty pages. So I think for me, yeah, I, I don't know, it kind of makes me think of like how I have to write or a lot of people have to write and there's almost this like desperation to hold on to those words to remember by heart even because i think when when i think about the 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 reason i started writing poetry which is like um my somali heritage all of those poems would be remembered by heart would be recited would be passed down um and i think it is a kind of resistance because when i was uh, i was looking up I was doing more reading around Wally singing and I came across this interview um, where he said when he was in prison, he uh, he wrote, I think, a few of his books actually on toilet roll and on the backs of like cigarette packets. And I think like, I think they tried to, they tried to take away his, um, his ability to think and his ability to create. And I think when you're able to write, you can you can imagine yourself out of a situation. You can imagine a world that's different to the one that we're in. And I think it's a form of resistance. Um, and for me personally and, and selfishly, when I write, I'm trying to, I'm trying to understand everything that happened in my family and like before the war, that kind of rupture that happened. And I'm trying to, really it's to try to heal myself, I think, when I think about it. And if I'm really honest and, like Nick said, if it's not serving ego, then sometimes I think that means confronting some difficult realities about myself, confronting some difficult realities about my my family. Um, yeah, but I think I think it's the way that I and a lot of other people understand the world, world um, and that I'm ultimately very grateful to to be able to do and to engage in. Oh, thank you both. Um... When you're talking about memorization and, and how language can save, um, for me, almost even practically, the idea of memorizing. When I was a child, my father made me memorize poems. Um, and then when I was older, a couple of groups I was in, we basically would memorize each other's poems. And I kind of enjoyed it purely, almost almost selfishly, because you get to show up. Look, I can memorize longer than you. So kind of childish uh, uh, competition. But um, I had began to get quite sick, you know, a few years after I was in some of those collectives. And then this one time I woke up, I, I had lost my vision, I can hear. And I've never been so grateful to have memorized 
all those poems because I think even the I mean, like Nick says to to write as a gift and and wow what a wonderful gift but also to be able to read other people's work is in itself such a joy and a blessing and um, and I think to have those poems squirreled away somewhere in my mind was um, I've never been that grateful for anything in a long time and so I I was just thinking about who we keep in our minds and being and I I would I'd like to return to that practice of memorizing poems and 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 approaching them in that way. So I'd love to, to pause and then make, I'd love to hear you read uh, for us. Okay. Uh, this poem is called Codex Nine. Codex Nine, zero, zero, 0021. Start tape. We begin here. In transit, it is September, and I'm inventing a kind of time the way that Coltrane did in Alabama. I am looking for a hole in the ground or lightning from a skin tree with its fragile brightness that spikes below the water line, not to be seen from the dirt road. Where is my city, perched on seven hills? Where is the sky in its height to watch the evening crawl in? Where are the horses that broke loose? I know I come from another world that is both sheath and blade, both booze and blood. You have me in a room. Your boss is using my last name outside this door to express the relationship between me in part and its whole. The word sounds strange at the edge of his mouth like bait at the end of a hook. I glance at a clock. The ceiling tiles are perforated and you ask, why did you move from the home I once had to this home? Your silence is also a hole. The soil from which I come does not want my return. Men who look like me in the eighth century came to the hem of your shores. They used the wind like a stone in a sling. I used an air bridge. I used a runway. I used a loud flight path. I used an airport lounge of a country known for its invading army. I used who I am in this night with its far off star. I used what nobody would admit. The geography is everything. End tape. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nick. Thank you both for reading. Um, yeah, I'll be thinking of that. And I'm going back to the idea of poetry as music. And yeah, I, one thing I think we're all missing is a bit more room to hear each other read out loud. And so I'm really grateful <laughs> to, to both of you for that. Um, I want to close today um, and open up the space to uh, one, you know, share any reflections that you've been sitting with. I know, again, community has, has taken different forms. Uh, during the last two years. So share what you're thinking with uh, broadly or as specific as you want. Um, but particularly, I'd love um, if you would share where you would like to take your, your writing and your poetry um, over the next year, or the next day, uh, the next decade. Um, kind of paint that picture of where you're hoping for that to go. That's a hard question, but um, I mean, what I can say is, I know we're both that because I've been speaking to Asma a little bit, but I know we're both working on new work, and um, I mean, I I put it to the group when we were in Obsidian, but I'm um, I'm trying to play the game that I'm asking them to play. I know I'm trying to just take bigger risks with my work. I don't know what that means. I I, I don't know what that looks like. Um, so that means both on the page and then what it it eventually becomes. So. Um, and, and there are many reasons for that. Uh, you know, similarly to uh, Asma, I've been listening and reading and watching a lot of things and watching a lot, listening to a lot of biographies and stuff like that. And uh, one of the artists that moved me was uh, Billie Holiday. And uh, not the music. I mean, the music is amazing. I mean, I mean that's that is genius level music. 
but it was actually the woman behind the music. Because you think the story she lived, she should never have been that good a musician. Because I don't know how most, most people could not survive just her life. But she sang with such joy. And that to me was inspirational. And then to sing that song that really, that really recounts how the black body is being used, it was almost, uh, it was like a sermon. And I just got that this, I got that her life, we relate to her as a musician, but I, I, I think she was a freedom fighter. But she did it through her art by doing something that was so transformative. And, you know, to me, you know, I watched the documentary and I was in tears. To me, she's as powerful, if not more powerful, than Malcolm X and Martin Luther King and all of that. And, I, and it made me wonder, what else do the women do that we just don't like? We just go, oh, she was a great singer. So you say Billie Holiday. Oh, I love her singing. Mm -hmm. That's just the tip of the spear. You know, like her song, every time that song plays, we are, we are back to those men being hung from the trees. And we, we will never forget it's her singing that gets us there. But she's not just talking about those men's pain. She's talking about her own pain in her own life. And I, I was moved. I was just moved. And I was like, wow, I wonder what else is hidden inside of women's stories. That's what's really in my mind. Um, I, I don't think I always have the place to write about it, but I definitely want to read about it. And uh, I don't know. I don't know what else to say. I'll shut up there. But you know, does that make sense, Asma? Does that make sense to you, to Alex? Yeah. Yeah, it makes so much sense. Um, I think to add, I I agree with you. I think I want to. Yeah, I think I want to push push the work that I do. I don't think I don't think I don't think of poetry like as a sacred thing. I think of it more as like a a mechanism. It's like a it's like a tool that I use to yeah, to like collaborate with other people, whether we end up doing like a theatre thing or a film or you know, like I just I think yeah, it's just the way that I understand the world and it's my language. But I think I'm really interested in telling stories um, and at the moment the, the stories all seem to be i guess moving around like migration transients um my my identity um yeah and i guess also ghosts and spirits so i think those are the themes that i'm kind of interested in um and what else i think i think i'm also trying to like at the moment write about my mother or more about my mother because I find that I often write about my father, my grandfather, and I think that's I don't know what reason that is, but um, I'm I'm trying to unpick that, so that's kind of a challenge that I've set myself. Um, but other than that, I think just trying to improve improve my craft and experiment. Yeah, I think part of that is in society where the light shines; it shines. But it, the society is trying to shine the light on men, um, you know, men in general, but then usually white men. But so you, you just like, you know, exactly what you're saying. You said mother. I said, you know, Billy Holiday, you know, you know, I had it was it was something had to turn me. So the, the female director who made that film turned my thinking because all the time, whenever we think of freedom fighters in America, we think of Malcolm X, we think of Martin Luther King, we think of, you know, um, Huey Newton, all, all those people. Where, where, where are the women? But there were women, and there were many women. You, you understand? So what it is, is you're, you're having to untrain yourself to yeah. how society, like you said, you have to, I think that's what the poet has to constantly do, unhinge yourself from the usual paradigms to be able to tell the stories that slip through the cracks, you know? Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you both. And I'm really keen to, again, more people reading Rosie Lang, who I work with a lot, uh, my co-founder, she has been working for a number of years trying to get visual illustrations of um, women writers, African women writers, but then more importantly, uh, women artists. Uh, so even visual artists, you often, when you think of Kenyan visual artists, for instance, you, we have such a 
long history of sculptors, filmmakers who are women, and they just don't come to mind. And those are people who are ideally should immediately <laughs> um, be at the tips of our fingers. So one, you know, reading and see me wider. And then also, you know, the idea of Billie Holiday thinking deeply, um, at least meditating a bit longer and wider on their work. So I'm keen, I'm keen for more of that. And I'm definitely keen for more community together. And hopefully that takes different shapes, these sort of networks of care. Um, and I think that's, that's kind of, I just want to thank you again for your time. Is there anything else that you were thinking of that we didn't get to talk about? Because yeah, I have, I have a lot on my mind, but yes, jump in. <laughs> I mean, it's just pull it to pull it. I'm really inspired by what Jalad is doing, but also well, Asma, I'm, I'm really inspired by what you're doing. Every time I see your work, whether it's like what you're writing or what you're putting in visually, it's, it's, it's on point and it's encouraging. And um, I know you have your collective, but I, I just wonder who else. And also you make it, me proud to be East African. Um, um, and I think that's something, I think there needs to be that kind of co coalition, you know, like it's really, it's, there's a lot of good right, uh, poets in it coming from the East African general, but the East African diaspora, I mean, it's, it's just, uh, I just wanted to uh, big you up that way. Thank you, Nick. I really appreciate that. And I'm always inspired by your generosity with your time, with the spaces that you create. Um, yeah, thank you. How with your mentorship, like honestly, I think a lot of people speak, but they don't act. And I think what I see from you is always actions. Yeah. Well, you do the work, man. Every time I ask her to do something, she does it. Every time I say, hey, write this, she writes. I was like, wow. Alexis, thank you so much also for facilitating this space and asking those wonderful questions. Yeah, yeah thank you for the interview. Amazing interview. Yeah. Of course, of course. And then I think we'll wrap up here. <laughs>